Ange with Sam Yukta for another episode for season two of A Little Perspective. Today, we are talking to a good friend of mine, Holly Fidel, and we are going to talk about her very unexpected seizure diagnosis. Sam Yukta, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking, Angela. I also am uh, excited to hear Holly's story and share it with our viewers today. So Miss Holly, she is from Eunice, Louisiana, and is a social worker and licensed therapist. Holly, thank you for joining us. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about yourself? Hi, I am Holly Fidel, and um, I am, like they said, a social worker and licensed therapist. I work at a clinic in uh, Ocean Springs, Mississippi, where I do private practice practice therapy. I only see uh, adults. I'm not a teenage therapist, not having it. Um, and no kids either, pretty much just adults. I specialize in the LGBTQ plus community. That's my passion. Um, I have three kids and um, one that is fixing to move out. He is 21. So um, there are some mixed feelings about that happiness, um, fear, um some sadness a lot of mixed feelings yeah gosh I can't I, I can't imagine I, can't, <laughs> I, I literally can't imagine I know it'll be here before I know it but I can't imagine that's so crazy so Holly um aside from being an amazing therapist and you used to work in the prison system we could probably talk about that for hours but right. we're not here to talk about that we are here to talk about your um your seizure seizures so um how long has it been since you were since you started this journey with um with the seizures just kind of coming on out of nowhere and then the struggle to figure out you know the who what when where why tell us how it all started well, um, most people think of seizures. When they think of seizures, they think of the ones where you fall on the ground and mm -hmm. you have lost consciousness. Um, you urinate on yourself. Um, you know, um, people try to talk to you. You convulse. Um, you don't wake up for a few hours. Those are those kinds of things. I have had some of those, um, but um, a lot of mine have been different. And that's something that I did not know. Um, ahead of time is that you can have different types of seizures before you have those seizures where you fall on the ground, which everyone knows about. Um, so um, once I knew about those other types of seizures, I realized that I had been seizing for about six months before I had my first um, big seizure. That's what I call them, the big ones. Um, I just didn't know what they were. I thought that I was just stressed out. You know, I hadn't been sleeping well, a hard job. Um, and now I know that I was having seizures that whole time. Um, I don't know if I should say this, but the first big one um, was actually during sex. And um, my ambulance, uh, my husband called the ambulance and um, we make jokes about it now, you know, about like, wow, that must have been really good. Um. <laughs> and I know, I know your husband, so I can, I know, I know that y'all are making some good jokes out of it. <laughs> right. Um, but um, the ambulance brought me to the, to the hospital and uh, the ER doctor said, you, everyone gets at least one good seizure possibly in their life at least one so he said you know mm, oh well um and then they did tests they did blood work they did um you know the um ekg eeg all of that didn't find anything um didn't even refer me to a neurologist um one day i was leaving work and uh i woke up in the car with my foot on the gas in the car, of course, um, you know, vroom, yeah, revving. Um, revving. And I was in the parking lot, luckily. I had bit my tongue, there was blood, and I realized that I'd had the second large seizure. Now, um, you know, depending on your beliefs, um, that was God, that was luck, whatever you wanna call it, um, that I was not driving at that moment um so it was recognized that that was a second um 
the old word is grand mile, um, grand mile seizure. Um, there's new terms for everything. But um, so that's when I started seeing a neurologist and everything started falling into place at that point. Um, now about maybe a year after that, I spent a week in a hospital in New Orleans where uh, I was hooked up completely with the, I look like an astronaut heading into space. Um, they took me off all meds, kept me up um, because sleep, lack of sleep is a trigger. And that's when they caught the seizures. Um, and I got the final complete diagnosis of epilepsy. So they had proof of it 100% as opposed to just symptoms. Before you were officially diagnosed and before you had, you know, the first big seizure that you mentioned, what did it feel like before? Like, what were the symptoms um, before you knew that those well, were the seizures? The smaller ones, um, everyone has auras. Well, not everyone. That's actually misspoken. Um, not everyone has an aura and an, an aura is something that tells you that something is about to happen. And mine is a deja vu of, it sounds crazy. And everyone that, when they talk about deja, um, auras, it sounds weird to everyone else. Even a neurologist is like, oh, that doesn't really make sense. Um, mine is of the first time I ever got my nails fi finished. Um, I used to be a nail biter. And the first time that I got a manicure that were my nails, I remember looking at them and being so proud that I, I had stopped biting my nails. I have deja vu of that, of looking at my nails and being proud. And it is a very specific um, order in which I look at my nails. And at that point after that, I either lose consciousness, um, lose the ability to speak, um, or what everyone is saying turns to gibberish. Um, and then it either proceeds to a major seizure um, in which I lose consciousness or it doesn't. And then it just stops. So that's what it feels like. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I feel like I can get you know what you're saying. And it sounds like to me, which I'm obviously not anywhere close to a doctor, it sounds like to me, like, like the electricity is sparking like that deja vu or like that memory, you know, like your neurons are, that's neat. Sorry, I'm kind of processing this, that's, that's neat. Um, so the, the second big seizure, is there like, at what point did they say, okay, it's not just a one-off, it's not just, you know, temporary, or, or not to say it's not temporary, but it's not just, it, it is seizures, like, they finally decided that, is it like, because you had two big ones, was that part of the, like, acceptance of it being that, or what do you think was part of the determination, that's the word I'm looking for, determination for your um, diagnosis? Uh, different neurologists play this kind of differently. Some look at it and say, we're going to figure it's epilepsy if the medication stops it. Um, some say we want to actually catch this on the EKG. Um, and until we catch it, we're not going to believe that it's epilepsy. We might see the medication help but we're not just gonna 100% call it that. Um, so it depends on the neurologist. Some just what say, you, go, go ahead, ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Cause you're probably about to answer the question. <laughs> so um, I've seen two neurologists. Um, the first one I felt was not um, taking me seriously. Um, so I switched to one that I had better reviews from, from other people and that I felt listened to me better and she is the one that sent me over to new orleans for a week-long test and that's when they actually caught everything on the test and they could make the final diagnosis at that point they even could tell at which part of my brain which side of my brain and everything where it was going how oh. it was starting everything so we had all the answers that we needed 
when did you do that? How long from when you had the first big one? Oh, um, it was about a year, a little oh, over wow. a year. Mm -hmm. Gosh, you know, I remember a lot of your journey because I, you know, we, we chatted and checked in on you, but, um, and I remember it being a long time before you really felt like you, you had an answer. Why do you think there's a hesitation to call it epilepsy? What is the, I guess, what is the harm in putting the epilepsy stamp on it as opposed to saying, uh, we don't know, you know, like I see there's not like a pain pill issue, you know, like what, do you know what the hesitation is? There is, um, as a therapist, especially we see, um, I'm going to forget the word. Um, so it used to be called pseudo seizures, which is very, um, offensive now. Um, people with severe trauma in their lives, um, as opposed to having a panic attack where, you know, we have the hyperventilation and the racing heart, uh, beat, um, they have, um, seizure activity now, but it's not actually in the brain. It's more of a physiological, um, which looks like a seizure, but actually isn't the neurons firing. Awesome. So, um, so with, if they're hooked up to an EKG, it, it shows nothing here in the neurons. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes people, doctors, neurologists are afraid to call it epilepsy without knowing for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so they may send that patient to a psychologist and say, well, let's see if they have some trauma in their life that's causing this, as opposed to the actual neurons misfiring. But it's mm -hmm. called P- N E S. And now that you're asking me, I'm going to forget the actual terms um, <laughs> that those letters stand for. Um, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to remember immediately after we stop talking. <laughs> that is fine. That is fine. So would then I assume if, if that's the case, if it's a misdiagnosis, then giving the medicine would that be harmful is that is that a risk is that part of the concern the side effects can be a risk yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i gotcha that makes sense have you experienced like the side effects from the medic any of the medications oh yes 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 just like most medications you know you watch the commercials and the commercials are an hour long when they're telling you you may you may experience this 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 and this um most of the um epilepsy medications that i'm on have changed my ability to remember words um or um it takes me a while to to kind of drag them out you know and that, that usual, I know that word, I know that word, I just can't find it. It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, that has gotten worse since I've been on the medication and the seizures too, both of them can affect that. Um, sleepiness, of course, I feel kind of tired a lot of the time. Um, and then my memory, my memory is shot. And that can happen from the seizures and from the medication. Wow. What about when you're in, you know, working, you know, how do you manage your epilepsy? How do you manage the side effects? And have you, you know, requested accommodations to assist in um, doing your job to the full, to your full potential? Well, I have been very honest when I do interviews because this newest job is, um, is very new. It's only been, it's been less than two months. Um, so I did tell her immediately um, that, um, that it's fairly controlled. I haven't had anything too serious lately. Um, just mostly auras, um, but that there is always that possibility. Um, and she has been very understanding. We have decided not to tell patients, um, unless I feel an aura coming on. Usually once the aura comes on, I can tell if it's going to become more severe or not. So um, if it's going to become more severe, I'm going to uh, step outside and knock on the door or something so that my coworkers can hear that knock and know that something is not, is not good. 
um, and hopefully come out and tell the patient because I, you know, I don't want to affect the patient. Um, we thought about putting a sign, a little sign saying, you know, therapist has epilepsy, but that just, it felt, um, a little, um, a little too proactive to tell something to therapists or to patients that may never happen, you know? Um, it just, I, I didn't want to give them that much of my life, that much information on my life when it might not be needed, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Did you um, have fears, you know, telling her or did you feel like your connection with her was, um, you felt like she was the kind of person that would understand and, and be okay with it. Oh, I certainly felt like she was the kind of person that would understand. Also, there's the logistics of it that I couldn't, um, I couldn't avoid. And that's that I can't drive in the state of Mississippi. Um, you have to be seizure, even aura, because an aura is a small seizure. You have to be free of that for six months before you can drive. So um, I have not driven in almost two years. Um, so um, I have to be able to tell employers um, that, you know, look, this is the way it is. Um, I have to be here at this time. Um, I may have to stay until this time. If that results in overtime, then that's, you know, you hire me or you don't. Um, but I can't drive. So I'm reliant on chauffeurs to take me where I need to go. Um, and she understood that. Um, and luckily it's not a, it's kind of a, it's a job where I base it on my own hours. So it works out well. You that's mentioned, awesome. oh yeah, oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just saying that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I remember seeing in your bio that the epilepsy that you um, deal with ha is drug resistant. Could mm -hmm. you, do you mind um, di diving more into that and like the experience of um, what the drug resistance is? Sure. Um, so it basically, um, it kind of, it's almost like mental health meds. If, if uh, viewers have, you know, tried different mental health meds and they realize that lots of antidepressants don't work for them and they keep trying and trying and trying. Um, I've been put on different um, anticonvulsants because I, I, at first they work and then I build up a tolerance to them. So then they stop working. So then I have to move on to a different one and the same thing happens or we increase the dose and increase the dose until it stops working. And of course, every time you increase the dose, you increase side effects and, um, so it becomes kind of this vicious cycle of, of increasing and changing side effects or de decreasing and changing or adding a different med. And it just becomes exhausting where sometimes you don't even want to tell your neurologist that something isn't working because you just don't want to start a new med, but then you don't want to have seizures either. So you kind of just weigh your pros and cons and say, what do I want to do? Um, at some point there is brain surgery where they implant devices um, that try to stop the seizures before they happen. Um, my neurologist is very sweet. She sees me for 45 minutes every appointment. She does not rush me. I mean, you know, every doctor has following appointments that they have to do. So I'm sure she can't see me for two hours, but she's not uh, rushing me to get the appointment done. Um, but she's very kind. But the other day, last time I saw her, she said, um, she said, well, one of these next moves might be, might be an implant. And I was rushing because I had an appointment uh, later that day that was very important to me that I wanted to get done. So I was just like, okay, yeah. And let's get this on. Let's get this going. And then I get home after the appointment that I had. And I thought, did she say implant? <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I tell my husband, I said, she said implant. And so I go online, of course, and I go to Reddit, which has a very large epilepsy group. And I said, she said implant. What does that even mean? So they all start telling me about implants and what that means. And it's basically um, an implant in your brain that tries to stop the neurons from misfiring. And um, we're not necessarily there yet. Um, we found some meds that so far seem to be working. Um, so I'm hopeful. It's been about three weeks since I've had an aura and that's the longest I've gone in quite some time. So I'm hopeful. That's a great to hear. I'm glad you found like something at least for now, you know, now. To three weeks, you know, it could feel like forever, you know, especially <laughs> if this is like the longest you've gone. So I, so that's really good. That's really good to hear. Do you Tell mind you sharing uh -huh. I'm sorry. Let me. I'm going to interrupt because I just, okay. I just thought, I just thought of something. Um, you posted the other day, Holly, about how you might have. I just remembered this. How you might have had been having seizures for. You may have been having seizures for a little while longer than you thought because the medicine you were on before um, was the anti. Was it also was also an anti seizure medicine? Is am I recalling correctly? Yes. Um, so if a lot of people know about mood stabilizers, um, which can be used for bipolar, um, the most famous one is Lamictal. Um, Lamictal is a mood stabilizer, but is actually also an anticonvulsant. I was on um, Lamictal as a mood stabilizer um, when the seizure started, but apparently it was not a large enough dose to prevent the seizures. Um, and of course, we don't know why all of a sudden I developed seizures at 40. I think this happened at 41. Um, but yeah, the lamictal wasn't high enough to prevent that. Now I'm on a much larger dose of lamictal. Is, um, is there a family history of epilepsy? None. Okay, so it's um, are there any like underlying conditions that may have caused it? None that we have found. It is like the most random thing ever. <laughs> it's almost, go ahead. I was going to say it was, it's almost the, the most scary thing ever is that you can just be driving on the road on the interstate and all of a sudden develop epilepsy. <laughs> yeah oh. exactly exactly like do is it common for epilepsy is does epilepsy typically run in the family is it typically genetically passed down do you know um i know that there's a higher risk um that happens yes but i wouldn't say like statistically i well i'm not even gonna yeah, I don't yeah. know enough about it. We're not even going to go there. <laughs> but I know they did. I get asked that frequently from doctors. Mm -hmm. Well, did you have that history in your family? So it must be somewhat important. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Is there a way to like, well, no, because you've already answered. I was going to say, is there a way to like test? Like, because because you have kids. Um, but you've already, we've already heard how you got diagnosed. And so obviously there's not a way to test. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. What are some misconceptions that people have about epilepsy? I mean, in, in earlier you were saying that like, it's, you know, portrayed how it's portrayed. Every, many people think it's like the, the big ones. Like if it's a seizure, it's the one where you're, where you're, you know, convulsing, shaking on the floor, but you mentioned there's, you know, different the auras and there's different types so what are some other like you know common misconceptions that people have um one of the big ones is that um everyone with epilepsy is photosensitive which means the flashing lights um so i even thought that before i was diagnosed um that oops there's a flashing light um a person with epilepsy is going to have a seizure um, photosensitivity is actually not as common as you think it is. Um, so when, um, when I was working at the jail, they tested the fire alarms very frequently, you know, the flashing lights. 
and um and people would say holly close your eyes close your eyes <laughs> and i kept telling them over and over again i'm not photosensitive so it doesn't it doesn't affect me at all to see flashing lights um it doesn't it just doesn't yeah. um so that doesn't bother me um some of the other misconceptions happen in those um least educated countries and we saw that back in the day here um that it's you know demon possession um things like that more kind of religious um connotations um uh, that it can be prayed away or um or that is such a mental illness that the person needs to go into a mental institution uh -huh. to try to cure them as opposed to, um, to, you know, a, a brain misfiring that needs medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I knew that, that people had thought that it was demonization, but I hadn't thought of it until you just said it. That's funny. Not funny, but you know, um, when moving forward, what kind of, um, like, what do you think your, I guess, treatment plan would be the only word I can think of? Um, I know that you already have a medication and, and it seems to be helping a little bit, but moving forward, what, what does the future hold? Like, do you, is, is there hope that, you know, you go six months without an aura and then you're able to drive again, or are you just maintaining? What are your thoughts on the future? Well, I'm actually on three medications right now. So the hope is that all three um, combined keep it going. Um, and that within six months, I'm able to drive again. Um, although I'm not sure if it'll be right at the six month mark. After not driving for all of this time, I'll probably be pretty fearful of yeah. driving again so I may it'll be like a 16 year old that first gets behind the wheel and yeah. you know only goes to to very close by the house and then comes mm -hmm. home and goes a little bit further next time mm -hmm. um I might be fearful and um and take a little while longer than the six months um but right now it's it's to maintain the medication that I'm on if it continues to work um, if it stops working, then, um, then the neurologist plays around with it a little bit more. And, um, and if we continue to have that problem where um, my body adjusts and it stops working, then we'll look at the implants. And, you know, I, I'm fearful of that, but if it stops it, then that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't even realize that was an option. That's really neat. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. So, um, Samyukta, do you have any more questions? Um, I think we're wrapping up, huh? Yeah. Um, is there anything, Holly, that you would like to share with the viewers or, or just how, you know, we can be better advocates or just like be better aware, you know, of epilepsy and of the different types? Hmm. I think just the big, the big thing is that remembering that, um, that epilepsy is not exactly that falling on the floor convulsing, um, because so many people, um, will hear that maybe a coworker or, um, even someone, maybe they just started dating has epilepsy and they'll say, oh gosh, when are you going to, um, fall on the floor and what do I do? And, and they may not believe that other, the coworker or the person that they're dating, when the person says, no, it might be that I start staring at you and I don't understand what you're telling me. And I can't speak back to you. And I don't remember the last five minutes that just happened. You know, that's, um, that's a whole different other kind of seizure. And, um, that misconception that the coworker had may lead them to say, well, that's not really epilepsy. That was just you not paying attention to me or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So just that misconception about, um, 
that epilepsy is actually only the convulsing on the floor when it's really not. Mm -hmm. Something I, I just thought of, which I thought of before when I was preparing for this, but I completely forgot is um, in, so with dwarfism, especially achondroplasia, um, our uh, form magnum is, is often narrow. So our spinal cord is pinched from where it goes into our skull, essentially can be, can be. And, um, in, in the book that I did last year, where, um, I had parents of children with achondroplasia write, uh, stories about their, the, from birth to toddlerhood, two of the stories had, were seizure stories. And, um, they, the, the seizure, it was not the flopping around convulsing and it's a, these are, these are babies, you know, it's, it's um, their body just kind of goes, goes limp. And they, they said that their eyes, like you just, that you just, they're like, they're not there. Like they're just kind of staring. And um, you know, the first time it happened, it's always like, uh, what's going on? My baby's not breathing. And then, you know, after, then the more it happens, the more you're like, okay, this is like an issue. And um, decompression surgery can, for, for dwarfism, um, can help with that. So just another like little awareness tidbit, you know, that, that this can happen to babies too. And again, it doesn't look like the grand mall, the flopping around or what have you. It, it's very, um, they can present differently. So um, I just remembered that I wanted to share that. So yeah. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's interesting how um, it can be a comorbid, comorbidity for other conditions as well, not just a standalone epilepsy, you know, condition. So um, Holly, thank you so much for sharing everything with us. You are such a gem. I am so grateful to call you a friend. And like I said, we have like a whole list of things we could have talked to you about, but um, I really wanted to, to share this because again, like you said, you could literally just be driving down the interstate and have a seizure and have no family history, have no, you know, other priors or what have you. So um, I think the takeaway is to, to be mindful of your body and don't let other people tell you that something's not wrong if it is. Um, because sometimes, like you said, with the auras, like even the doctors don't really, some of the doctors aren't like, eh. You know, so just knowing yourself and, and being unapologetic about your own advocacy is, is absolutely key. So, um, and you are an amazing advocate for all, for all, for all, for all. It's beautiful. So um, thank you so much for being here. Sammy, you, do you have anything else you want to share? Oh, just that, the, again, I echo everything Angela said. And like, I, you know, learned a lot today, you know, just, you know, hearing your story about epilepsy, you know, just the different varieties and just about auras and, and you know, the, the idea of like, oh, well, you're having an aura, you're experiencing, you know, epilepsy, but then to the other person, they might think you're not paying attention, you know, and that's really hard. That, and that is something that, we, you know, we need to understand and we need to be, you know, more mindful of. So thank you. It, it was such a pleasure to meet you. You too. Both of y'all, it was nice talking to you. Thank you. Got anything else you want to share, Holly, before we say goodbye? No, I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, all of you, for listening um, watching. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, I personally can say that Holly will likely answer them because she is such an advocate. Um, so um, please send them our way. Put them in the comments or what have you. Um, but thank you again, Holly. Thank you as always, Samyukta. I will see mm -hmm. you soon. And I hope that all of you have the most amazing day. I love y'all. Bye. Bye-bye. everyone.